All right, let's talk about reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is a process or method through which one attempts to understand through deductive reasoning how a previously made device, process system, or piece of software accomplishes a task with very little insight into exactly how it does so. We perform reverse engineering on any piece of software if we don't have access to the source code. And for that matter, we use multiple techniques. Analysis through observation of information exchange most prevalent in protocol reverse engineering, disassembly using a disassembler, meaning the raw machine language of the program is read and understood in its own terms. Decompilation using a decompiler, a process that tries with varying results to recreate the source code in some high level language for a program only available in machine code or bytecode. Assume we have this Fizzbuzz program written in C. We all know that we use some sort of a compiler to turn the C code into a working binary or executable. Now say that we want to take this Fizzbuzz program and see how it works. And this is where reverse engineering comes in. We need to find a way through which we can get as close as possible from the original source code. But first, how in the world does this executable actually work? If we were to create a hex dump for this executable, we can see that there are some printable strings that are embedded in it. The strings say a lot about the binary, like what compiler it was compiled with and some strings related to the source code itself, and much more. There is a utility called strings which you might be familiar with. This utility prints all the printable ASCII characters in any binary file, and much more. Any executable or PE file stands for portable executable has some headers and sections that store information about the PE file. The most important ones are the data and the text sections. The text section contains the code or the assembly instructions that will be executed at runtime. The data section contains writable data with some initialized to non-zero content. This section gets modified at runtime. Some data is overwritten and some stay untouchable. But in order to reverse engineer any PE file, it will be intimidating to only look at the file headers and sections. Yes, we can use any PE parser to achieve that, but it will still be hard. So in order to make this process easier for us, we use what's called disassemblers, such as IDA and Binary Ninja, which take this PE file and kind of massage it and parse it to output a sequence of assembly instructions that we can make sense of and reverse. We can even make the reverse engineering process easier by using decompilers such as Ida Hexrays and Ghidra, which by the way was developed by the NSA, the National Security Agency. A decompiler takes the assembly instructions and tries to recreate a pseudocode similar to the source code. Now with these aspects of the way, let's jump in and see how reverse engineering works in action. Here we have an executable called quote unquote product, which we want to crack or reverse. When we run it, it asks us to input a serial key to activate the program. And this is the form of the serial key. Now we need to understand the key checking algorithm to be able to write a key gen that gives us a valid serial key each time we run it. So let's jump into IDA and start reversing. Alright, now in IDA from the left panel, let's select the main function and look at it. The function starts by checking the number of arguments supplied. If d equal to 2, it will jump to this branch. If not, it will jump here and print those two lines, which what we saw earlier. So now it's obvious that this function is printf. Now in the other block, there's a call to this function, which seems to be the function that validates the key, judging by those two lines. So now let's rename it to verify key. Now there are two ways to do this, the easy way and the hard way. The easy way is to just patch the executable and completely bypass the key checking algorithm. The hard way is to completely reverse engineer the key checking algorithm and write a key gem for it, 
We're gonna do it both ways. Let's just start with the easy way and patch the executable. So let's patch it using Binary Ninja because patching using IDA is a little bit intimidating. In the left panel, the same as IDA, we can see the defined functions in the executable. However, we don't know which function is the main function. So in order to find it, we can check the strings in the main function that we saw in IDA. You can find the strings in the view tab. When clicking on the strings from the main function, we can see in the bottom left corner the function from which this string is referenced. Now let's set the view to the graph view and the decompilation to assembly. Looks identical, right? Let's rename this function to main and do the same thing we did in IDA. Now in order to patch this executable and completely bypass the key checking algorithm, we need to change this conditional jump to unconditional jump. And always make it jump to the address we desire. In our case here, we want it to always jump to the address of the first instruction in this block. So let's copy the address of this instruction and create an unconditional jump to it. Sweet. Now we completely bypass the key checking algorithm. So now let's save this patched executable to disk and rename it to product correct. Now when we run it, no matter what input we give it, it will always print a success message. But this is lame and we are pro hackers. So instead let's do it the hard way. Let's completely reverse engineer this key checking algorithm and after that we will write a key gem for it. Alright, here we're back in IDA. Let's seek to the verify key function and start reversing. Since reading the assembly can be intimidating for some beginners here, and instead let's use the IDA decompiler. So press F5 to switch to decompilation mode. Here we have some defined local variables and some if blocks that need to be satisfied in order to print the success message. Here we have a call to the string token s function and it takes three arguments our input, the delimiter and the address of the context variable to store information related to the function itself. This function is the equivalent to the split function in python which splits a string by a delimiter. So that means this is the first part of the serial key. So let's add a comment here and rename this variable. Let's also convert these hexadecimal numbers to decimal for easier analysis. Here we have the second part of the key. So let's also add a comment here and rename the variable. And the same goes for the remaining two parts. Now in the first if block, the first part of the key is being converted to integer by this function a to i which i think it stands for ascii to integer it is similar to the int function in python which does the same thing after that it's typecasted to unsigned integer which means the first part cannot be a negative number then we subtract lead and compare the result to 2000 if it's less than or equal to 2000 it will proceed on to the next part of the key so that means the first part cannot be less than lead or greater than 3337. The second part is pretty much similar to the first one. Here we subtract 7337 from the second part and compare the result to 2000. If it's less than or equal to 2000, it will proceed onto the third part. So the second part cannot be less than 7337 or greater than 9337. In the third if block, we have two conditions that we need to satisfy. In the first one, the third part of the key cannot be less than 1000. And in the second condition, the third part is ended with 1 and the result must not equal to 0. Let's break down this condition to understand why it's ended with 1. Assume we have these even and odd numbers represented in binary. First, let's keep track of the logic and gate truth table. When we end all the even and odd numbers here with 1, we will notice a pattern. All the even numbers when ended with 1, the result will always be 0. And all the odd numbers when ended with 1, the result will always be 1. So in order to satisfy this condition, the result of this expression has to equal to 1. 
which means the third part of the key has to be an odd number and greater than 1000. The fourth part of the key is the same as the third one. The only difference is that it must be an even number to make this expression result zero. Now for a keygen to work, the serial key that will be generated must meet the following criteria in order to satisfy the key checking algorithm and get to the success message. Here I have the keygen implemented in Python, and yes, there are a lot of ways to implement it, but this is just my way of doing it. So here we have only the random module imported. And in the main function, we have a defined array to store all the four pieces of the serial key. And in the first part, we generate a random number between lead and 3337, and then we append it to a serial key array. And in the second part, we generate a random number between 7337 and 9337, and then we append it to the serial key array. Then in the third part, in a while true loop, we generate a number between 1000 and quad 9. And then we check if it's an odd number or not. If so, we append it to the serial key array. And then in the fourth part of the key, we do the same thing, but this time we check if it's an even number. And if so, we append it to the array. And finally, we join the four pieces of the key by a dash and print it to the screen. Now, when we run our keygen and supply it as a key to our product, it will be activated at once. Pretty cool, huh? Let's do a couple more. We're pros now. Now with that out of the way, let's take a quick look on how reversing works on Linux-based systems. Here we have the same executable, but this one is compiled for Linux-based systems. And this one is called an L file, while the one on Windows is called a PE file. Running the file command on this binary tells us a lot about it, like its type, its architecture, 64-bit in this case, and it's a position independent executable, which means that it gets loaded in a different address in memory each time it's executed. Dynamically linked means all the libraries that are linked to this executable get linked to it at runtime. Also the flag not stripped here means all the symbols like function and variable names inside this executable are not erased. And this is the same keygen that we wrote earlier. When loading this elf binary in IDA, we can see that it's similar to the PE file that we reversed on Windows. Even the functions look similar, with some differences like, for example here, the compiler on Linux replaced the printf call with a put syscall for performance and optimization sake. But everything else is identical and works the same way it does in Windows. If you want to boost your reverse engineering skills, I highly recommend our Euroverse CrackMes from CrackMes.1. It's an awesome platform for those who are getting into reverse engineering. You can choose the language of the CrackMe that you want to reverse, the architecture and the platform or the operating system. Also keep in mind that the difficulty of the CrackMe ranges from 1 to 6. So if you're a beginner, the lower, the easier. All the CrackMe's on this platform are protected with a password, which is CrackMe's.1. If you like this content and learn something from it, check our Patreon down in the description.